Hello everyone and welcome to the One Stop Co-op Shop. This is Colin and today, yes, it is time for another Arkham Horror campaign. The Edge of the Earth campaign. This is the one that recently came out. It came out as a single box set for all of the scenarios put together. And this awesome campaign guide instead of those blasted pieces of paper. <laughs> I love this so much more. Uh, yeah, this is so nice and it's going to be nice for recording. We'll be playing with two investigators, Lily Chen and Ursula Downs for this one. I thought that would be fun. And there's a ton of intro into this one, so we're just going to jump right in. Make sure to use the timestamps if you don't want to hear the flavor text and you just want to jump into the game. Also, don't forget to turn on those Klingon subtitles. They should be popping up right now. If I make any errors that I miss when I initially edit and someone tells me later, I will put them there. Okay, without further ado, let's go ahead and meet our two investigators. Not many people can say that they've climbed a mountain on every continent. Fewer still can say they've stolen a golden idol from a tribe of cannibals. Among women in a male-dominated society, Ursula is unique in being able to make these sorts of claims. Ever since she was a small girl, Ursula has broken the rules set down for her, climbing trees, playing in the mud, exploring the woods, and doing plenty of other things that a proper young lady shouldn't be doing. Since getting a degree in archaeology in Boston, she has been traveling the world searching for forgotten civilizations. Yet she just seems awesome. I haven't played with her yet, so that's why I decided to play with her. You can see her here. Her deck size is 30. She can have secret cards level 0 through 5, relic cards level 0 through 4, and neutral cards level 0 through 5. She'll have Jake Williams, Call for the Unknown, and one random basic weakness. Her stat line is 3 willpower, 4 intellect, only 1 combat strength, and 4 agility. She is a wayfarer, so after you move to a location, you can take an investigate action limit once per round. Super awesome, though. Free actions. I always love free actions. 7-7, seven, seven, if she does draw that elder symbol, uh, we have a plus one. After this test ends, you may move to a connecting location. I'll put a link in the description below for the deck that I'm using. I made a couple modifications and the big one that I'm going to start with is in the thick of it. This is a permanent limit at once per deck. Each of my characters is going to have this. Purchase at deck creation. When you purchase in the thick of it, suffer a total of two physical and or mental trauma. So I'm going to suffer one of each. So we're going to be a 6-6 six, six instead of a 7-7. Seven, seven. Then earn three experience. And what I'm going to do with that experience is I'm going to start the game with one charisma. That way I can have two allies right on the get-go. I drew my random basic weakness, and I have the unspeakable oath. Uh, we have its peril and hidden. Secretly add this card to your hand. When the game ends or you're eliminated, if this card is in your hand, you earn two fewer experience. After you successfully investigate a location with no clues on it, discard this card from your hand. So she potentially is going to have to <laughs> investigate a location with nothing on it to be able to get rid of this card. Chen Li speaks rarely. When she does, her words are measured and wise. After a lifetime of disciplined training, every gesture is graceful, uncluttered by hesitation. The monks who raised her said that she was born for a special purpose, to face a great evil. Now they believe that evil is at hand and she is the only one who can stop it. Lily has a really interesting deck setup. So same size, 30. Mystic cards, level 0. Guardian cards, level 1 through 5, so not level 0. Neutral cards, level 0 through 5. And up to 5 other guardian cards that are level 0. <laughs> And she also has what are called discipline cards, and she'll start the game with one discipline card and then one burden of destiny. Every 15 experience, she's going to gain another discipline card, but then has to put another burden of destiny in her deck. She has a total of 3 willpower, only 2 intellect, 4 combat, and 3 agility. You begin the game with each discipline in your deck in play, unbroken side face up. If she draws that Elder Sign token, plus two, after this test ends, flips a broken discipline you control to its unbroken side. She's also seven health and seven total sanity. Just like Ursula will have in the thick of it, that means we suffer one mental and one physical trauma, uh, but we get to start with three total experience. Our first one will be Safeguard. This is going to allow us to follow Ursula when she moves around. That costs us two experience. And then one, we have the Ever villain, vill Vigilant, <laughs> if I can say anything. One at a time, play up to three assets from your hand, reducing the cost by one. Here we have her four disciplines. I'm going to choose this one. Each one will power up one of her stats. You can see this one's willpower. We've got strength, we've got agility, and we've got intellect. The one we're going to choose and start off with is this one. 
it says plus one to her willpower, so her willpower will actually be four, and then she can take an action to take one direct damage and heal three horror, or take one direct horror and heal three damage, but then we flip the card over, then it becomes broken. That's what this means. And it says here, after this round ends, if you took no damage or horror this round, you can flip this back over to the unbroken side. Here is one of the Burden of Destiny cards that she'll have in her deck. And remember, as she gains more disciplines, more of these will go into her deck. Really cool. Uh, and she's also a little self-centered. <laughs> so that was the one I randomly drew. Uh, it can only be used for multiplayer, but that is the, uh, the weakness, the random weakness that she'll have throughout the campaign. We've now met our investigators. Let's start our adventure. So as I mentioned before, make sure to look down in the description if you want to jump ahead. Otherwise, let's read and see what our adventure will be. You understand now, yes, why this expedition must be stopped? Professor William Dyer sits across from you at his office desk. A wealth of academic papers and scientific journals lie sprawled between you, including Dyer's own lengthy account of his journey to the Antarctic. Up until the publication of this revised report, The Alleged Truth, the university's last expedition to Antarctica yielded very little in the way of scientific discoveries. At Dyer's request, you read through this new report of what really happened beyond those mountains of madness, as he had dubbed them. You scarcely would have believed any of it if it were not for the bevy of photographs and drawings that came along with it. Evidence of mangled, dissected bodies, of perplexing five-pointed snow graves, or strange specimens found half-buried in the ice, and finally, aerial shots of the jagged black peaks described in Dyer's tale. Dyer has called on you to help convince his colleagues to abandon their planned follow-up expedition. His student, Danforth, the only other member of the expedition to reach the alien stone city described in Dyer's report, paces back and forth by the entrance to Dyer's office, muttering nonsensically to himself while you consider their strange tale. You're still unsure what to make of all this. On one hand, Dyer's concern seems genuine and his account is filled with such detail and specificity that you find it difficult to doubt its authenticity. And yet, there's no way it could all be true. An ancient city in the ice built by primordial beings? So-called elder things? How could such a thing be real? Danforth mumbles something about a nameless black pit as you place Dyer's report back on his desk. The professor gazes at you with sleepless bloodshot eyes. Well, Dyer asks, you will help us stop this madness. Will you make them see reason? We must decide either to believe them and proceed to Prologue 2, or I'm sorry, it seems too wild to be true, skip to Prologue 3. I feel like our group is more on the Prologue 2. I believe you, but if what you say is true, should we not investigate these findings further? Dyer lets out an anxious breath and relents. I suppose I might have said that same thing once, but now, after what I've seen... A shudder courses through the man's aging body. You are venturing somewhere humanity does not belong. I'm starting to believe that scholars such as ourselves can only continue to probe the depths of science for so long before we are laid low by what we find. Or by what finds us, Danforth chimes in from behind. Dyer glances at his student, studying his expression then turns his attention back to you. If you go on this journey with Dr. Kensler, the lot of you may not ever return. Will you not reconsider? You explain that while there is surely significant danger in your expedition, Dr. Amy Kensler, the scientist leading this new trek to Antarctica, has taken precautions to ensure it does not meet the same end as Dyer's. More importantly, it is the only way to understand the threats they encountered, and the only way to prepare if such threats are unearthed by others, less cautious scientists. <laughs> yes, I... I confess I had that same worry, he replies. We are unlikely to convince the greater scientific community, I'm afraid. Perhaps it would be better to... to return and learn about what we saw. Danforth nods. I agree. How do we know what we saw is anything more than overactive imaginations of two explorers with a queer fascination for the bizarre macabre? Of Arthur Gordon Pinn's ill-fated journeys? Dyer's eyes narrow at his student. The knowledge reflected in his dark eyes chill you to the core. You say such things, and yet I dare say you did not see what I saw. <laughs> The student scoffs. You are not the only one who glimpsed that mirage at the edge of the mountainside. I am not referring to the mirage, Danforth. I am referring to what I saw in you, Dyer retorts. The things you said on that airplane, the look on your face, I will never forget. 
Silence pervades the room as Danforth returns to his corner to languish in his own doubt. Dyer pleads with you. Whatever the case may be, is there nothing I can say to deter you? You ponder for a brief moment, then shake your head. There's too much at stake, especially if Dyer's account turns out to be the truth. All right, then, Dyer concludes with a sigh. Since you lot have no clue what you're getting into, I suppose we have no choice but to come to. You can tell Dr. Kensler that she wins. We will be ready to leave within the week. You shake his hand and make for the door. I hope, for all our sakes, that Danforth is right, he adds before you are out of earshot. In your campaign log, record the investigators convinced Dyer to allow the expedition. Add one cultist token to the chaos bag for the remainder of the campaign. You peer up at the overcast sky, hoping it does not forebode things to come. Only a sliver of sunlight peeks through the clouds. You shudder and pull your coat closed over your shoulders, then continue onward to the edge of the Boston Harbor dock. Standing in front of the plankway leading up to the deck of Theodosia is Dr. Amy Kensler, a professor of biology at Miskatonic University. The no-nonsense scientist has been a fixture of the university's science department for over a decade. Without so much as peering up from her clipboard, she crosses off your name as you approach. Good of you to make it on time. Mr. Ellsworth here will take your luggage aboard. Oh, I will, will I? The man standing next to her replied with a chuckle. He offers you his hand in introduction, and you shake it. Rolled Ellsworth, at your service. By way of introduction, Dr. Kensler explains, Mr. Ellsworth has been on over a dozen expeditions and comes highly recommended. I'm sure his expertise will be invaluable in the weeks to come. Ellsworth rolls his eyes. His expertise, yes, and his willingness to be used as manual labor, he added with a chuckle as he hefts your luggage and takes it up the plankway. Come on, Ellsworth, shouts another voice from inside the ship. A gruff-looking man with a thick brown beard emerges, motioning for Ellsworth to hurry. We got a ton of work to get done before we embark. A little busy, Cookie, Ellsworth shouts back in reply. Then he turns back to you and remarks over his shoulder. Do not mind him. Cookie is a bit of an intense fellow, but he's all right. The name's Fredericks, the gruff man barks back. James Fredericks. I swear, sometimes I think I'm the only one here who's ready for this gosh darn trip, he muttered angrily. And didn't anyone ever tell you it's bad luck to name a ship after someone who's died at sea? Come on! Another voice calls down from the deck of the ship. Cookie, if you could be so kind as to lower your voice, some of us are trying to work up here. The man responds with a grunt and ducks back inside the ship, rolling his eyes. You crane your head upwards and see a young woman leaning over the railing of the ship's deck, her long brown hair tied in a thick ponytail that dangles around her neck. Hey, you made it, she calls out to you. Dr. Kensler was pretty excited that you were coming along, looking forward to working with you. Without looking up from her clipboard, Dr. Kensler mumbles, Miss Takada Hiroko, an aeroplane mechanic. As with the previous expedition, we'll be constructing our planes on site. No need to worry. She may be one of the youngest in the field, but she knows what she's doing. More of the crew began to arrive, one by one. The first is a man in his thirties with a wispy blonde beard and bright green eyes. Mr. Avery Claypool, Dr. Kensler introduces you to the man and the two of you shake hands. Mr. Claypool is an associate of Mr. Ellsworth. He will be serving as our guide in the Antarctic. Weather permitting, Claypool jokes, honestly, we'll be lucky if we can even get off this ice shelf. I'm confident with your skills we'll make it as far as Dryer and Lake did. That's what I'm afraid of, Claypool mutters, walking briskly past Kensler and up the plankway. On his way up, he passes Ellsworth and the two freeze, locking eyes. You could swear that the temperature lowers several degrees as the two brush by one another without a single word. They are usually on better terms, Dr. Kensler says under her breath, but recently fell into some issue or another. They had better learn to live with their differences. They will be unable to avoid one another for quite some time after all. You watch as Claypool's gaze wanders back to Ellsworth for just a fraction of a second before he turns away angrily and enters the ship. The next to arrive is a woman with warm brown skin and weary eyes. Along with her luggage, she carries a rather large bright red medical kit emblazoned with a white cross. She extends her hands and you cannot help but notice the nervous tremble in Dr. Kensler's hand as she shakes it. Thank you for joining us on this voyage, Malda. Oh, Amy, somebody has to keep you alive, she replies. There's a moment of awkward silence as Dr. Kensler glances up at the woman, then down at her feet, her cheeks tinged red. Right, well then, she remarks and continues up the walkway. Dr. Kensler clears her throat once she is out of earshot. Dr. Malasina is our physician, she explained. It took some convincing to get her to join us, so try not to abuse her expertise with inconsequential problems. Frostbite will be a very real concern, as will gangrene and hypothermia. 
Try to stay on her good side. You're unsure if Dr. Kensler is joking or not. <gasps> a man's voice pierces the sudden silence, along with the clamor of a dog barking. <laughs> Anu! Gosh darn Anu! Don't run off like that, he shouts. That will be Mr. Ashevek. Dr. Kensler says, scratching off another name from her list. Moments later, you watch as a large gray fur dog bounds towards you, its tongue hanging out its mouth in excitement. You lean over and pet the dog, running your hand along her thick, long fur. The man finally catches up to the dog, huffing with effort. A new, come on, I thought I trained you better than this, he says, catching his breath. Elia Ashivek is our dog handler. Dr. Kensler interjects. He is in charge of taking care of the 44 dog sleds we are bringing along with us, not to mention their feeding and training. Anu here makes 45. He corrects her before turning to shake her hand. Also, we'll be holed up in this ship for a while, so let's drop the formalities. Just Elijah is fine. As the man and his enormous dog board the ship, you ask Dr. Kensler if she received the letter you sent regarding Professor Dyer's concerns. I am well aware of his report, Dr. Kensler replies, but as I have told him time and time again, I have no intention of ceasing or postponing this expedition. Just then, footsteps approach behind you, interrupting your conversation. Speaking of the devil, Dr. Kensler mutters, looking up from her clipboard, you turn to find none other than Professor William Dyer and his student, Danforth, each toting several bags of luggage. I'm glad you finally decided to join us, William. Amy, he acknowledges. I am not here because I believe in your mission statement. I am here to make sure you and your companions do not get themselves killed. You have no idea what you're walking into. Then you'll have ample enough opportunity to educate us along the way. She turns to address young Danforth, who is staring up at the tanker ship with a pained expression. Danforth, I hope you understand that you are under no obligation to come along this expedition. After everything you went through, she trails off, her eyebrows raised in worry, atypical of her usual cold demeanor. I appreciate your concern, Dr. Kensler, but I am looking forward to the opportunity to return to Antarctica. I want, need, to be there again. She follows his gaze to the Theodosia, which bobs steadily up and down on the choppy Atlantic waters. Very well. We're still working to get all of our equipment aboard. Mr. Ellsworth can help you find your rooms. You nod and begin boarding along with the remaining crew and the rest of the expedition team, mostly students of the university, along with several unaffiliated explorers and several researchers in a variety of fields. Once more, you spy the scant silver of sunlight above before it is smothered by gray clouds. Scenario 1. Ice and Death it has been a long eight weeks since you left Boston, and not without its toil. The Theodosia followed much the same route as its predecessors, the Arkham and the Miskatonic, first sailing southward along the east coast and through the Panama Canal, before venturing towards the Antarctic Circle. As the weather grew steadily colder, icebergs became more and more of a problem for the ship to navigate. But with the crew's expertise and the logs of the previous captain who made this same journey, you make good time. Soon enough, you spy the mist-covered peaks of Mount Erebus and tear ahead, marking the site of Ross Island near the ice shelf that will serve as the expedition's landing spot. As you approach the coast, Dr. Kensler and the rest of the team meet aboard the deck of the Theodosia to discuss your plans. We'll use the same breaches buoy system as before to unload supplies onto the ice shelf, she explains. Mr. Frederick, Mr. Ellsworth, and Mr. Claypool, you'll be taking one of our smaller boats to the shelf to find us a landing zone. Miss Takada, once we have a camp up and running, those aeroplanes are your first priority. Mr. Ashevek, I expect those sleds to help move supplies from the landing to camp. As soon as we reach the ice shelf, there's going to be a lot of work to get done in a short amount of time. I don't want you to have to wrangle three dozen dogs on top of all of that, so get them in order. Alaya rolls his eyes and idly pets Anu, who sits diligently by his side. Yes, ma'am. Professor Dyer speaks up. I suspect the lack of ice melting and boring equipment means we aren't taking any mineral samples, he asks rhetorically. Dr. Kensler shakes her head. No need. Although if we happen to find a suitable piece, we might as well claim it. That said, our mission is solely to corroborate the findings you made with Danforth and to bring back more evidence of this ancient species, these elder things as you dubbed them. A living specimen would be ideal, of course, such as a strange and alien beast trapped in an ice throughout the ages. It would be like discovering a live woolly mammoth, I imagine. He balks at that. <laughs> a live specimen? You do know these things killed several of Lake's men, right? And how do you propose we capture one, exactly? She blinks. You're the expert, William. You tell me. <sighs> Dreyer walks off, shakes his head, and mutters angrily, I knew this was a bad idea. All right. 
You all have your assignments. We'll reach land within the hour. Be ready, Dr. Kensler says, dismissing the meeting. Before she can go below deck, you approach and remark that you aren't sure what you should be doing just yet. Oh, there will be enough manual labor to go around, she replies with a hint of a smirk. After two more weeks and many hours of hard work, the expedition is ready to make its first foray into the cold, dead continent of Antarctica. Miss Takada, along with two other mechanics, have fully assembled three airplanes along the flat ice shelf, a perfect place for takeoffs and landings. Your team congregates by the airplanes, along with several days' worth of camping equipment. The plan is to fly two of the planes over the vast, jagged peaks, taking aerial photographs of the stone city mentioned in Dyer's account. That is, if such a thing really exists. If we can find a safe landing zone, we will set up a temporary outpost, Dr. Kensler explains. Dyer, Danforth, Fredericks, and Claypool will stick around while the rest of us head back to base camp. We can use the sleds to ferry supplies to and from the camps. Otherwise, we'll simply scout out the area and head back to base camp. The team nods in agreement and begins boarding the planes. Buckle up, your pilot says. You climb into your seat and get ready for the flight. One at a time, the two planes take off from the ice shelf and soar into the opaque fog. The rough Antarctic winds and low visibility makes for poor flying conditions, but nonetheless, you venture through the beautiful and deceptive polar mirages over miles of icy wastes and barren snowdrifts. Dr. Kensler peers out a window as you pass a magnificent view of distant mountains like vibrant enchanted castles floating above the clouds. Ah, oh, they're beautiful, she remarks quietly. These are nothing, Dyer begins. Wait until you see. And then the storm hits. The winter winds are so sudden and fierce that they almost force you out of your seat. Both planes shunt to and fro in the horrid winds, and you hear several of the passengers shouting behind you. What in the world, Frederick Rance? We have to head back, Claypool shouts. These winds will force us down if we keep going. We're so close, Dr. Kensler growls bitterly. We don't have a choice, he yells back, but it's too late. The plane lurches towards the ground and the pilot struggles in vain to regain control. All the other passengers notice the dark shapes in the sky at the same time you do. It's a massive shadow, like a curtain drawn across the mountains, or perhaps the tattered wings of an antediluvian behemoth. It scowls at you with dreadful, hollow eyes. Then it reaches out and... As you regain consciousness, intense pain sears through your blistering skin. Through the haze, you can barely hear muffled shouting outside the burning husk of the airplane. Somebody grips your arm and pulls you from the wreckage and hurls you into the soft snow. More shouts erupt all around you. There's another! Quickly! Grab my hand! You rise to your feet with a world of effort. Miraculously, you're only bruised and winded. Most of the other team members are similarly unharmed, except... Gather the nine story assets from the expedition team encounter set, shuffle them, and choose one of them at random. The chosen character was killed in the plane crash. In the expedition team section of the campaign log, cross off their name and record in the campaign log that they were killed in the plane crash. Find and read the passage in the next column that corresponds to the character killed in the plane crash. Then proceed. Dr. Sinna looks up at the rest of the team and shakes her head, lowering Claypool's arm back into the snow. Ellsworth places a hand on Cookie's shoulder, but the gruff man only shakes it off. He points an accusatory finger at Takada. This is your fault, he shouts, trudging forward and pushing her into the ground. If you hadn't built this gosh darn plane like a death trap, Claypool would still be alive. Takada glares up at him. There was nothing wrong with the plane. You saw that thing in the sky, didn't you? A lion Ellsworth pull Cookie back by his elbows. Dr. Kensler helps Takada to her feet. Miss Takada is right, the scientist says. The plane did not malfunction. Something else forced it to the ground, and we're going to find out. As the party begins to depart, you see Ellsworth's gaze linger on Claypool's corpse. I, I am sorry, Avery, he says. For our setup, each investigator may choose one available member of the expedition team who's not crossed off to join them. Put the story asset for the chosen character into play in that investigator's play area. Then we have our scenario set up. We're going to grab all of these different scenario cards. We're going to set aside the specific cards that they have here. We're playing on normal. So you can see, check the difficulty level. If you're playing on hard, add one doom. If you're playing on expert, add two. We're not going to add any. We are going to shuffle the Tekali Lee weakness cards. There's 15 of them. I've shuffled them up and placed them on the side of the board. We are very likely going to be gaining those throughout the campaign. <laughs> There's also these snow tokens, and if we draw those from the chaos bag, it means you have to draw another token out of the chaos bag, and they're considered a minus one. And if ever you draw two of them, you automatically fail whatever test you're taking. 
Here is how the map is going to be set up. The ones that will be on the board are the crash site that's in the center. We have the precarious ice sheets on the upper left. On the upper right, we have the treacherous path. And then we have the frozen shores on the bottom. I did also want to show you what the chaos bag will look like. We're playing on standard, so you can see that row. That'll show you what is in our chaos bag. And then we added a cultist. We, of course, have our scenario card that tells us what the skull, the cultist, and the stone tablet will do if we draw those. You can read them here. The biggest thing is shelter values are going to be important from what I understand, so that skull can get really bad if we're at a high sheltered location. Cold welcome. This isn't exactly how you imagined your first foray into the Antarctic wilds. The stinging cold and lashing frozen winds will only get worse over time. After a location is entered by an investigator for the first time, put into play each set-aside location connected to that location, and we saw that on our map. You're going to have to find a way back to camp and soon, or you'll have to make do camping in the wilds. We can take an action. If each investigator is at the same location and that location has no clues on it, we can resign. You set up camp. Each investigator resigns. Our objective is find somewhere safe to set up camp. Each undefeated investigator has resigned, you can advance. The higher the shelter value for the location they resigned at, the better. So we want to find a high-valued one, which means it's more likely we're going to fail those tests if we draw the skulls. Lily will be our lead investigator. She is going to have Takada come with us. Takada has nine resources on her. It says here we can exhaust Takada to move up to three resources from her uh, to the resource pool of your character. Don't forget that Lily also has one damage and one horror on her to start because we started with three experience. We'll draw up five cards. Our first one is Scrying. Our second one is the Dragon Pole. That's the awesome weapon we want to use. We have Prepared for the Worst. We have Glory. And our last one, we have the Ward of Protection. Looking at our five cards together, I think the only card we're going to discard and then shuffle back in is Prepared for the Worst. And we're going to draw Arcane Initiate, uh, <laughs> Arcane Initiate and put that into our hand. Ursula's going to bring Dr. Sinha here, so we have a way of healing, potentially. Spend one supply and exhaust Dr. Sinha. Heal two damage from an investigator or another ally asset at your location. Once again, one damage and one horror. Of course, I have them in the wrong locations. There we go. We'll draw our five cards. We have the Touch of Etsley. Well, that's nice. We have Eureka. That's number two. Number three is True Understanding. Number four is the Hawkeye Folding Camera. I love that card. And number five is, is Manual Dexterity. Of these five cards, I think the True Understanding will set aside and draw a new one. And we have Shortcut. So then we'll shuffle this back in. We have our four starting locations on the board. We're going to start at the crash site. Unfortunately, I lost Ursula's little card, so I do have these standees that I can use in re replace of them. So that's what we're going to be using in this campaign. Uh, we're going to use these little, uh, normally they'd be standees, and it's kind of cool. It gives a 3D look. But when I'm coming down from the camera, it just makes sense to lay them down. All right, let's see what the crash site is like. The crash site has two shroud. You can take an action to test your intellect or your agility to scavenge from the wreckage. If you succeed, in the supplies recovered section of the campaign log, record spare parts. Cool. Shelter of zero, though, so we don't want to resign in this location. We'll start with Lily. Lily's going to spend her first two actions dropping down Scrying, so this will come with three charges. We can exhaust this to spend one charge, look at the top three cards of any Investigator deck or the Encounter deck, return them to the top of that deck in any order. Cool. We also are going to play our Dragon Pole. This has you, you have one additional arcane slot, so now we can have up to three. It says we can do a fight. You get plus one combat for each, uh, uh, for this attack, for each of your arcane slots that are filled. So right now we have one. So right now our combat, when we use that, is a five instead of a four. If at least two of your arcane slots are filled, this attack deals plus one damage, so we really want to find another spell as quickly as possible. For our third and final action, why don't we use Scrying? So we'll spend one of those charges, and we are going to look at the top three cards of our deck. What we're looking for is to get another Arcane uh, card as soon as possible. So let's see. Oh, we have Self-Centered. That's wonderful. And we have Six Cents. Well, we'll put that on top. And then we have the Holy Rosary. Perfect. I'll have these three, but that means Self-Centered is coming out soon. Ursula is going to spend her first two actions putting out both of these cards. The Tooth of Etsley. You get plus one uh, willpower and plus one agility while resolving an ability on a treachery card. 
After you succeed at a skill test, while resolving an ability on a treachery card, exhaust this to draw a card. Sweet. And then we have the Hawkeye folding camera, where if we collect the last clue in a location, we can put evidence on here. We can gain plus one willpower, plus one intellect, or gain plus one sanity. Ursula could move and get a free investigate, but I think instead we're going to do this action for action number three. And we're going to test our agility. We're going to use our manual dexterity, so our agility is four, plus two is six. We just need a three or higher. So let's draw our first one. That's a plus one. Uh, that means we definitely pass that, so we also get to draw a card. And we draw a uh, perception. Cool. That ended the investigation phase. There's no enemy phase, so we'll jump right to the upkeep phase. We will each get to draw a card and generate a resource. So that'll be the first one for Ursula, and then that will be the second one for Lily. Then we'll draw our cards. We have another shortcut for Ursula, and we know Lily's is going to be at six cents. During the mythos phase, we'll place one doom on our agenda, and now we'll draw our encounter cards, starting with Lily. Lily will draw. Let's see what she gets. She gets the Polar Vortex. Attached to your location. I think a lot of these are going to be attached to our locations. When you end your turn at the attached location, each card you control with health, including your investigator, takes one direct damage. At the end of the round, discard this. Okay, well, we just don't want to end our turn at the crash site. I think that's easy. We will then do Ursula. Ursula gets Dark Aurora. Test your willpower three. Well, our willpower right now is three. For each snow token that's revealed during this test, take one horror. If you fail, take two horror. Lily is at the same location as Ursula, so she's actually going to discard the arcane initiative to uh, be able to add plus one to her willpower. So her willpower is four. We just need it to be a three, so a minus one would be okay. Let's see. Oh, we get that. That, of course, is a minus three. And then for each point you fail by, discard the top card of your deck. Draw each weakness discarded by this effect. So we are at a three, plus one, which is four, minus three, which is one. So we fail by two. We're going to have to discard the top two cards of our deck. So let's grab those and we'll discard both of these. We have what? Practice makes perfect and true understanding. And since we failed, we take two horror. So we now have three horror already. <laughs> well, that wasn't great. Of course, the whole reason I have the Tooth of Etsley is so that I gain plus one willpower for treacheries. So I actually only failed by one instead of two. So I still take the two horror, but I'm going to take the true understanding card and shuffle it back into my deck because I only failed by one card or by one instead of by two. We'll start with Ursula this time. She's going to play at Shortcut. It's fast, so it doesn't take one of her three actions. Play only during your turn. Choose an investigator at your location. Move that investigator to a connecting location. And then when we move, because of our ability here, we can take a free investigate action. The treacherous path looks interesting, so why don't we move here? And let's flip that over. This treacherous path has a shroud level of two, two clues, a shelter of one, so not great. After you reveal one or more of the snow tokens during a skill test at this location, take one damage or horror for each of them revealed. And remember, if I reveal two of them in a test, it's an auto failure. Now, I only have one in the bag for now. <laughs> uh, okay, so we might as well do our free investigate. We have a total of four for our intellect compared to the two here. So let's draw one. We got a minus one, so that means we'll collect this clue no problem. We still have not done an action. I also need to remember to put out my Rocky Craigs because that location is connected to the Treacherous Path. Now, the Treacherous Path is also connected to the Precarious Ice Sheets and the Frozen Shores, but those are already out on the table. For Ursula's first action, why don't we do another investigate here just because I want to collect the last clue here because I can start getting evidence on my camera and that can start pumping up our investigation uh, abilities. So we've got a minus two. We had a four minus two. That's perfect. That'll work. We'll place this onto our board and we've now collected the last clue here. We now have a willpower of four normally and a willpower of five against any of those treacheries. I was just talking about the usefulness of the clues and read this card for Rocky Craigs. As an additional cost for you to enter this location, investigators at your location must spend two clues as a group. Well, I've got two clues. I have two actions left. I think I'm going to use one and move into the Rocky Craigs. That will mean I have to give up both of my clues. This location states when a treachery is attached to the Rocky Craig, that treachery gains surge max once per phase. Oh, it's a shelter three, though. Uh, let's also see what other locations show up because we have moved here. We have the frigid cave, which is only connected to the Rocky Craigs. 
and we have the barrier camp. So those are our two other locations we can go to. Both of them, we need to spend clues. This one, we need to spend eight clues to get there. That's probably a really good place to hide. Ooh, that's kind of an idea. As much as I don't love this, I think the only thing Ursula is going to do for her final action is simply move to the treacherous path. I don't want to end my turn here and place treacheries here that gain surge. Not worth it. Lily is still in prepare mode, so she's going to exhaust Takata to be able to move three resources from here to her resource pool, so she has a total of five. Action two, we're going to use the three resources that we just got from Takata to put out our six cents. We now have two arcane slots filled, so our dragon pole will deal plus one damage, and our combat strength for that fight with that is six. Cool. Our final action will be just to move up here with Ursula. We want to be in the same location in case anything happens. We can be there to help each other out. Still no enemies on the board, so we'll generate resources. Two for Ursula, three now for Lily. We'll each draw cards. We've got Dr. Milan oh, for Ursula. That's amazing. And for Lily, we know what this is. It will be the Holy Rosary. Second Doom will be placed here. Let's draw our two encounter cards. We also need to remember at the end of the round, we can discard this Polar Vortex. Our first card will be for Lily. Lily has Ancient Evils. We all know what that is. That just throws another Doom on the agenda. Let's just pump that up, shall we? <laughs> uh, and then our next card, we have another Polar Vortex. So that's going to be at the Treacherous, uh, the treacherous Path. So we don't want to end our turn in that location. We have our second shortcut here. Why the heck not use it? We'll move for free and get a free Investigate. We'll jump back to the Rocky Craigs, and let's see, we need to do a test of three. Our total intellect is only four, so let's use perception here, so we get two more, that's six. Six to a three, and if we succeed, we get to draw a card. Oh, we have the Cultist. The Cultist is only a minus two, which still means we succeeded. Ooh. Okay, so we'll grab this, we'll discard this card, grab one of these clues, and we get to draw the top card of our deck, and we have, I've got a plan. <laughs> This is totally a Barrett card. I love it. We'll spend our first action trying to collect another one of these, and we're going to play Eureka. If this skill test is successful, so we're adding one to our total intellect, that means we're at five, five to a three, then we can uh, look at the top three cards of their deck and draws one of them and shuffles the rest into their deck. Cool, but we need to be successful. So right now it's a five to a three. Let's draw the top one. That is definitely a skull. A skull is minus X. X is half the shelter value of the location that you're in, rounded up. So half is minus two then. And so we did three, we did five, we just got it. That works, so that's our second clue. That means we get to look at the top three cards of our deck and put one into our hand. Here we have our top three cards. You can just imagine we're not gonna do Call of Unknown. We're gonna do Crack the Case because if we can get the last clue here, we can also generate resources, which is cool. So put that into our hand. We'll shuffle these two back into our deck. For our second action, we are going to use I've Got a Plan to add one to our intellect. So it'll be a five to a three test again. So far, that has been just barely enough. Let's see, a minus one. That should definitely work. We've collected our second to last clue here. Are we gonna do it again? The thing is, the only other option that I have is moving back to the treacherous path, and then I would be taking damage, so that's silly. I think I'm going to just try and do a final test here. I'm not adding anything to this, though, so I need a minus one to make this successful. So let's see what we get. We get a minus one. Awesome. So we claim the last clue. That'll be our second resource on our Hawkeye folding camera, so now we have plus one to our intellect. So our intellect now is five instead of four for base. And we can play Crack the Case. Play after an investigator discovers the last remaining clue at your location. Investigators at that location gain a total X resources distributed as you wish. We're the only one there. X is the shroud value. The shroud value is three. So we just generated three resources. <laughs> That was cool. We have a total of five. For Lily's turn, we are going to move once for one action to get to the Rocky Crags. Movement two, we're going to ask Ursula, Ursula to use all four of her clues, and she's fine doing that, so we can go to the Frigid Cave. Now, this is what I'm talking about, Shelter 6. Now, we need to get rid of all those clues if we did want to resign there, but it's looking like that is definitely an option. This location is not connected to anything else. That's kind of why I decided to beeline it towards it. But I'm really interested in what's here at the barrier camp if I need eight clues. Oh, am I tempted? <laughs> we do have an action here. We can add one of the snow tokens to our chaos bag. 
in the supplies recovered section of the campaign log record mineral specimen. Well, we have one action left. Why the heck not? We haven't drawn one yet. Uh, it does mean that there's a potential that we will auto fail now of one of our tests because if we draw two of those in a row, we'll fail. But I want those minerals. So our third action, we're going to do that. Put this into our chaos bag for the rest of the campaign. We have no enemies out on the table, so that means we can generate resources. Ursula now has six. Lily has four. Uh, Ursula will draw. I've got a plan. Well, you never know. And I think we know what Lily's going to draw. Her weakness. Bummer. We've got self-centered, but we'll deal with that. Going to that mythos phase, that will mean we have to progress to the next agenda card. Hold on, come see this. One of the other team members shouts at you as you trudge ahead through the snow. You turn back and examine what they have found. A second set of tracks in the snow, but smaller mishappen. Almost impossibly so. What in the heck could have made those tracks, one of your party asks. You stand dumbfounded. Very little wildlife exists out here in the frozen waste, and these tracks match nothing you've ever seen before. Nothing you can even imagine. You don't have to question what could have made such tracks for long. A shape emerges from the erupting snow, twisted and deformed like a splotch of ink spilled upon the canvas of reality. It makes a strange, almost familiar cry that is eaten by the howling wind. Lee! Lee! Then, with terrifying speed, it rushes towards you. Spawn a set-aside skittering nonsense at the lead investigator's location. Shuffle the remainder of the set-aside skittering nonsense enemies and the set-aside creatures in the ice encounter set into the encounter deck. Something dwells beneath the ice. Something you've never seen or heard of before. Not even William Dyer's horrifying report. Something unreal. Same thing, we've got seven doom. Every time we go to a location, we reveal or place out the connecting locations. Here we have the skittering nonsense. It's a hunter. When you defeat the skittering nonsense, shuffle the top card of the Tekaliki deck into your deck without looking at it. Oh, that's terrible. We'll discard this polar vortex that was out and then draw our encounter cards. We're starting with Lily. So Lily has the whiteout. Revelation attached to your location. Each investigator at your location gets minus one to everything. Oh, we don't want that in that location. We do have a ward of protection. Let's use it. We're going to take our second sanity. So, well, our sanity hit, I should say. So horror, we have two. And we spend a resource. So we're down to three. But we just canceled that card. I don't want that in our location. We want to be able to investigate there. Okay, the next one is for Ursula. Ursula has an ice shaft. She fell down an ice shaft. Uh, test agility three for each snow token revealed take one damage if you fail take three uh, or two damage so it'll be a total of three if we revealed one and we failed our total agility is four plus that tooth makes us a five i think we can do this five a minus two we're still okay so hopefully we're okay <laughs> we reveal a minus three no we failed gosh we stink at everything minus three we just take two damage we fell down that ice shaft that means Ursula is now a 3-3. Three, three. <laughs> well, at least we have Dr. Sinha who can help us. I mean, we are pretty risky, so it makes sense we'd fall down an ice shaft. All right, let's start that next turn. We've got that skittering nonsense that's on Lily. Well, let's probably deal with that first. What do you say we take out this skittering nonsense? It only has two health. We only need a combat value of two or higher to take it out. Remember, though, if we do that, we do gain one of those weaknesses, but I think it might be worth it. So we will, for our first action, our combat base value is 4, plus we have 2 arcane items, so it's a total of 6, and that means we deal 2 damage. So 6 to a 2, we'll draw from here. We've got the Elder Symbol. That's a plus 2. Unfortunately, I don't have any disciplines broken, so we won't get that effect. That will mean, though, that this scattering nonsense is no more. We'll discard that, but we are going to grab one of these cards and shuffle it into our deck. It's now there when we uh, draw it. I actually don't really know. I don't even know what they do. <laughs> I have never seen them, so I don't know. It's going to be kind of fun to find out. I don't know if fun is the right word. After defeating that enemy, we can play Glory as a fast action, so it doesn't cost one of our three. After you've defeated an enemy, draw two cards. So we're down to two resources from three, but we get to draw two cards from our deck. And we have Let Me Handle This and uh, Overpower. For our second action, we'll put out our Holy Rosary. So we have plus one to our willpower. That means our willpower is three, plus one because of our discipline, plus one here, which is a total of five. 
We'll then use our sixth sense to investigate our location and we'll use let me handle this to add one to our willpower. You can see here investigate using willpower instead of intellect. If any of those symbols are revealed during the test, you may choose a reveal a location connected to this location. You're now investigating as if you're at that chosen location instead of your location. And you can use either shroud value. We'll draw from our chaos bag and we have a minus two. Six minus two is four, that's great. That will be enough to collect one clue and that will end our turn. Ursula will use four out of the six of her resources to put out Dr. Milan Christopher. That's gonna give her plus one intellect and I am playing with the taboo, so it will exhaust him to be able to use that ability to gain a resource whenever we successfully investigate. So we can only do that once per turn. Action two will move into this location and that means we get a free investigate. Our total intellect is four, five, six. Yeah, total of six, six to a four. Okay, come on, we got this, six to a four. And we get, oh, a snow, so it's minus one. And we have to draw another one. Oh, that's the first time we've drawn that. Oh, and we have the cultist. That is a minus two, and if you fail, you have to shuffle that top card of the Talikili deck into your deck without looking at it. Oh, man. So that means we now each have one of these. We can try this one more time for our turn. This is our action number three. We have a zero. That means we'll collect this clue to a left, but that will end our turn. And there are still no enemies out, so we'll move right to the refresh phase. I do need to remember Ursula would have gained one resource because of Dr. Milan since we did successfully investigate. So then we'll generate another one. And Lily will gain her first resource. Then what we'll do is each draw a card. We have another Dr. Milan. And Lily will draw Guts. We'll drop that first Doom on here. Now let's draw our encounter cards. We'll start with Lily. She will draw the Polar Mirage. Attached to the nearest location with at least one clue and without a copy of this card attached. Okay, that's the location that we're at. After you discover or take control of one or more clues at the attached location, discard each non-weakness card in your hand and then discard this. Oh, okay, that's fun. Uh, good thing that uh, we don't. we both don't have a ton of cards in our hand. Then we have Antarctic Wind. This is for Ursula. Attached to the nearest location without a copy of this. Well, that'd be our location. Investigators at the attached location cannot play cards or draw cards from their deck. At the end of the round, discard this. <sighs> wow. Okay, I think the game is telling me to make camp here, don't you think? <laughs> Why don't we start with Ursula this time? She has intellect of six, so she just needs it to be two or less. So her first action, she'll draw a minus one. Perfect. We will grab, grab a clue, and then we will generate one resource thanks to Dr. Milan. So that means we have a total of five resources. Okay, that was our first action. Second action, come on, give us this last clue. We get a minus one, and we have to draw again. And we get another minus one that's an auto fail automatic fail even though that's only minus two we automatically fail it okay third action we need this we really need this uh we get a minus four no 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 that's a total fail so that means we'll move to lily lily's going to use six cents six cents uses her willpower her willpower is four normally she's got her discipline for five and the holy rosary for six so she just needs a minus two okay let's see what do we get and we get oh you know the cultist the cultist is actually okay. It's only a minus two. So that means we're a four and four. We don't have to do this shuffling. And that means we've collected the last clue. We have two more actions left. Our next action is we are going to resign and say we're going to stay in this frigid cave. That means our shelter level is six. Exhausted and quite frankly terrified by your ordeal, you decide this is a good place as any to make camp for the night. Perhaps tomorrow you can salvage some kind of academic value out of this heckish journey, but for now such things seem trivial. Survival is the only thing on your mind. As you make camp, you are haunted by the memories of the creatures you encountered in the icy wilds. Such entities should not exist. Not even Dyer's report mentions anything of the kind. Grim silence settles over the expedition team as you set up shelter. No one speaks of what they saw in the frozen wilderness. No one speaks of the awful sound those monsters made. You can only hope that this camp is secluded enough to avoid the attention of those things, whatever they may be. 
In your campaign log, write Camp Dash and next to it, record the name of the location the investigators resigned at. This location is referred to as the investigator's camp for the remainder of Ice and Death. Oh, cool. Record the camp's shelter value, which will be six. Each investigator earns experience equal to the camp's shelter value. Oh, that's cool. So we have six. Plus, we didn't have any in the victory display. So we have six XP we can use. In the Expedition Team section of the campaign log, record the amount of damage and horror on each partner asset in play. Well, we kept them damage free. I did that on purpose. Proceed to checkpoint one, the disappearance. Your sleep is anything but pleasant. The maddening cold bites at your flesh and the ever howling wind plays tricks on your mind, conjuring images of mishappen inky forms bursting out of the ground and rending your party whole. Oh. Just as you're finally beginning to leave such horrid thoughts behind, your rest is shattered by a startled cry. You awaken to find your camp in shambles and several of your companions missing. To your dismay, footsteps lead away from the relative safety of your camp and into the frozen wilds beyond. Who would do that? Find and gather the story assets corresponding to the surviving members of the expedition team. Shuffle them and randomly select a number of them equal to your camp's shelter value. These characters are safe. If every surviving member of the expedition is safe, proceed to disappearance too. No, I'm going to have a total of eight of them, I think, and my shelter is only six. That means two of them will wander off, I think. Instead of choosing six, I'm simply going to choose the two that wandered off. So the first one that wandered off, oh no, I love Ellsworth. He's so cool. And then the other one that's going to wander off will be, oh, Takada, you're my resource queen. Takada and Roald both went missing in the night. In the expedition team section of the campaign log, write M-I-I, M-I-A, next to the name of each character who went missing. Now we must decide. Uh, they're on their own. You'll skip the next part of the scenario. Proceed to disappearance too. Or go after the missing members. I kind of go after the missing members. You'll play the next part of this scenario. Skip to the disappearance three if you wish to do so immediately. Or disappearance four if you wish to take a break and proceed on the next time you play. I think I'm going to do disappearance four. We'll catch this in the next playthrough. You've decided to go after your missing team members. In the Ice and Death section of the campaign log, under Locations Revealed, re record each location you've revealed, and then clean up the game as normal. And when you're ready to begin, start at Ice and Death Part 2. Well, that was a lot of fun. I really like the backstories for all the different characters. I actually care about them. <laughs> you know, having Takara and Rald disappear, I want to get them back. It's not just because they're a resource. I feel like they did a good job with that. The story is interesting. I'm excited to keep going on. And, you know, if you didn't want to, you could just leave them behind and keep going with the main story. So I think that's pretty cool. I have to say this, I mean, the the book, oh, it's just so nice. I wish all of them, I want my Lord of the Rings ones like this so bad. Has anybody done that with their Lord of the Rings ones? And if they have, let me know how I can do that. <laughs> Because I want to, I want to, I want all of that binded. It would be amazing. So much better than pieces of paper, right? Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for watching. Let me know if I missed anything with my notes so I can make sure to put them in the subtitles. And we'll do a part two next time. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you at the next stop.